Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. Here's your host, Chris Lee. Commodore fans, on your feet, it's time to anchor down. Hello and welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast presented by Dr. Jody Jones DDS. We're part of the 440 Sports Network. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Our guest today, Andrew Allegretta. Andrew appears on the guest line, which is presented by Sutherland and Belk, a family-owned injury law firm. If you or a loved one has been hurt in an accident, give Taylor or Russell a call. That number is 615-846-6200. See what your rights are and if they can help. Now on to our talk with Andrew. Andrew Allegretta joins us today. We're talking Vanderbilt sports, mostly baseball, probably some hoops mixed in at the end of this. Andrew, thanks for joining us. Hope you're doing well, sir. I'm doing well, Chris. How are you? Doing very well. Um, let's talk baseball. It was an eventful series with Oklahoma State this past weekend. What did you take away? Well, first off, both teams are really good, if I can state the obvious. And I think Oklahoma State is very, very good for sure. Uh, if that's a team that ends up in a super regional, if that's a team that ends up in Omaha, I don't think I would be surprised. Uh, their starting pitching is very, very good between Justin Campbell and Medeiros. Uh, and then even Osmond, who they threw on Sunday, who Vanderbilt was able to hit last year, has made some nice strides. And I think that was kind of the consensus uh, talking to some folks with Vanderbilt is that their pitching has taken some nice strides. Not to mention they can certainly hit, uh, but the pitching has been pretty good for Oklahoma State in their growth. Uh, as far as Vanderbilt goes, I think they've got some pitching. I mean, I think right off the top, if you can get transitions from Chris McElvain, Nick Maldonado like you did, and not to say that Maldonado is a finished product or McElvain for that matter as starting pitchers, but it was a nice debut, I think, for both of them. Um, you're going to be okay long term. Um, I think it's 15 strikeouts per nine. If you take the 45 strikeouts divided by Goodness. three, and that puts Vanderbilt top five. Yeah, that puts Vanderbilt top five in the country. So, um, again, who knows if that's duplicated throughout the course of the season. We'll see who develops uh, throughout non-conference play. Uh, we'll see how the bullpen shakes out. But they seem to have some pieces pitching-wise that can be okay. Uh, the offense needs to be um, a little bit more crisp, obviously. right? Too many strikeouts throughout the course of that uh, weekend series. Uh, and I don't have to necessarily name guys you can go through and I'll pluck out the statistics, and it's not just one person in particular. Uh, not enough consistency stringing hits together from Vanderbilt's offense. Um, we saw gorgeous hitting on Saturday from Spencer Jones. Uh, the double that Don Keegan hit, I guess on Sunday, was an absolute rocket off the center field fence. Uh, so there was plenty of offense for Vanderbilt. They just didn't tie it together Uh the way that you needed to do in a weekend like that. So I think everything's going to be fine. But, boy, do you jump right into the deep end if you're both Oklahoma State having to play Vanderbilt and Vanderbilt having to play Oklahoma State. Yeah, I think my big takeaway, and this is what I wondered going in, would they have depth of arms eight, nine, ten deep with guys they could pitch? And we're doing this – on, what is it, Wednesday afternoon, probably three hours before first pitch or so, and we'll get a look at Devin Futrell. So most of you will be hearing this after he's had his outing, I think, but that's another one. I think behind Holton, he was probably their freshman they trusted the most after Holton, who we've seen, and I'm sure we'll see some more guys today. Gage Bradley, a kid who's – I think in their eyes, taking a step up that we haven't seen. I would I would guess we would see him today, and who knows, probably would have seen him yesterday had the North Alabama got, game not gotten rained out. And so that's my thing. I mean, and here we are, Christian Little, who a lot of people thought would be the best pitcher on the staff, you know, has pitched one of their first, what, 27 innings? So you never know. There's a lot of ball to be played. I don't try to make sweeping conclusions from one weekend. Yet I've seen the program long enough to kind of know what my eyes tell me, and I know what they had coming back with some of the veterans. T to me, that's the biggest takeaway out of the weekend. I think they're going to have pitching galore. 
So I certainly hope it's pitching galore, huh? If it's pitching galore, then things will be just fine. Um, I liked what I saw out of Hunter Owen. That feels like an arm that yeah, can develop yeah. and be a really nice bullpen piece for you. Um, we saw Grayson uh, Grayson Moore uh, throw in that weekend, and he did very well. Um, heck, Pat Riley came out of the bullpen and threw four innings with seven strikeouts. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's pitching galore. I don't necessarily know what it's going to be, but we talk so much about transitioning from a season in which you had Jack Leiter and Kamar Rocker into a season where you don't necessarily know the top end talents and where it's going to go. You feel like there's potential, but you've got to get the performance. And, and I think after one week, and again, especially against that lineup, that is a good lineup against that lineup. Um, you feel like you've got depth of pitching if you're Coach Brown. Uh, again, we'll see where it all goes, but you feel like you've got depth of pitching. I'm with you there. Yeah, they've got depth of pitching and, and maybe some good backup vocals, it sounds like, too. Yeah, there's a lovely gentleman here uh, performing uh, <laughs> what is uh, a pretty a – pretty, uh, Solid rendition of the national anthem. We should never hurt for national anthem no, performers. No. You know that? You should absolutely never hurt for a national anthem performer. Ever. 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 No. So you're, you're doing this from Hawkins Field. I, I think I knew that, but I don't know that the audience knows that. So um yeah, yes, that was I sure am. that that cracked me up. I was like, who is who is singing? But but now we know. Um Yes. The hitting I think it's going to get better. I, I came into this year convinced that they're not LSU. They're not Ole Miss. They're probably not Arkansas, but they're pretty darn good. Uh, I think this is, in my mind, probably a top 10 lineup in America. It didn't show it the first weekend. I guess the big question I have, well, there's there's several. Let's start here. When I talked to Tim Corbin, I got the impression that, that Carter Young had been working his way back, um, You know, just laying off as long as he did hurt you uh, you know Carter wants to, to play well as much as anybody but I'm not convinced we saw 100% Carter Young on opening weekend and I think once you get that guy back if I'm right that makes a big difference so um, first off I do think pitching should be ahead of the hitting at the start of the season I think so um, I'd be curious the the coaches take on that but timing and rhythm and feel and all of that sort of stuff is earned in game action if you're a hitter. Uh, so the fact that anyone's offense might go through a couple of paces in the first few weekends, I don't think is surprising. Not to say everybody needs that sort of thing, but if you're going to go up against Oklahoma State's pitching staff, I think there should be grace uh, given to a really good offensive lineup as they get themselves into a rhythm uh, to be in the batter's box. Having said that, I think you bring up a good point, and I would have to go through my notes, Chris. I don't want to go guy by guy, but I'd have to go through my notes. There are a couple of guys coming back from off-season bumps, right? Whether it's Carter, yeah. uh, and again, there are others. I, I don't want to say somebody that's not accurate, so I'm not going to say which ones, although I'm, I'm pretty sure I've got my list in my head. But there, there's any number of guys that have come back from off-season bumps, and it just slows down how much you've practiced or trained throughout the course of the fall, uh, during January, whatever it happens to be. I mean, Coach Corbin noted the fact that Enrique Bradfield was, was bouncing back from a knee injury over the summer and into the fall. Uh, so his rhythms were, were a little bit slowed. I, it wasn't a significant one, right? But I think anybody with a couple of brain cells could connect the dots that Enrique didn't have – uh, a steal in Omaha, which is very odd for him. Yeah. Uh, so, right. So there's a couple of uh, obvious dots to connect there. Uh, again, not serious. He'll be fine, but it's, but it's just, it's timing. It's rhythm. These things, these things stack up on you if you're an offensive player. So he's doing fine. And all of these guys are fine. It's just, if you were dealing with something throughout the course of the off season, of course, it's going to take a couple of games or a week to find it. And if you're a hitter and you've got a weekend where you go over 10, that's okay. You'll bounce back and go, I don't know, seven for 10 another weekend. And all of a sudden you're seven for 20 and you're a 300 hitter. So we'll see where it goes. There's a few things that I'm curious with on what the lineup card is going to look like today. And again, people will probably have 
seen the game or heard the game by the time they hear this podcast. But the two things that, that are on my mind are first base slash DH and where does Javier Vaz hitting? Let's go to the latter because he had, what, a 638 on base this weekend. He got on base a ton. I'm, I'm going to say in the postseason he probably led them in on-base percentage without looking, and he can run. And I think – I mean, not not to say that Tim Corbin and Mike Baxter don't know what they're doing, but I just don't think you can keep a guy that produces the way that he's produced in his trial between the end of last year and this year in the eight hole. You know, I think the luxury of Javi Baz is the fact that he gives you flexibility. Uh, he's capable to hit just about anywhere in the lineup. And if I'm not mistaken, I think there was a game or two in Omaha, in which he hit fourth or fifth or sixth, something like that, right? So um, he's flexible throughout the course of the lineup, and I think that's that's a luxury that he brings you. Um, in an ideal world, uh, he is a guy that fits, I would think, somewhere at the bottom of the order or at the very top of the order based on what he can do offensively to put pressure on defenses. Like, logically, that's where he makes sense. But to your point, he was very productive. And if I got the lineup card here in five seconds and it said Javi Vaz was batting fourth, I wouldn't be shocked. But I think that's that's the flexibility. That's the veteran presence that he brings. Again, if Carter's hitting home runs and Parker Nolan's hitting home runs and Dom Keegan is hitting home runs, you want Javi at the bottom of the lineup or the top of the lineup. So he's on base when they hit home runs. I mean, that's that's just obvious stuff. But, you know, we'll we'll see where it shakes out. Uh, he, he is the ultimate, like, play anywhere sort of person in the lineup. He, he doesn't feel out of whack anywhere, one through nine. I said the other question was first base slash DH. Really, you can include second base in there, too. Because I think Tay Colwick is going to be the answer at one of those. I don't know if it's going to be this thing where it goes on all year, where he's starting at second one day and, and first the next. I don't know how that's going to work out. But those three spots, to me, what is your gauge? Davis Diaz, I think it was a real surprise we didn't see him more. Thought we'd see him at second. But I think what dictated everything was they wanted to go Vastine at first because he was a lefty that had some right-handed starters. You can move Colwick a couple of spots, and it all falls down from there. I'm just really curious to see what it's going to look like at those three spots going the rest of the season. Those are probably the three most interesting, right? Because you can pencil in Bradfield in center. They want to pencil in Spencer in right field to let him get comfortable. Carter oh, I, I think he's comfortable. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. I mean, I like Spencer's game. I really like Spencer's game. He had a not so great at bat on Sunday late in that ball game uh, with a chance, I think, to tie it up. I don't know if it was bases loaded, runners at second and third, whatever it was, and he got jammed, and it was just a pop-up to short. That that was not his greatest at bat, but I thought he had a good weekend. Um, first base is very interesting to me. They've got, they've got a couple of options, but Chris, man, uh, Coach Corbin talks about having athleticism at first base, and you give up – uh, size with Vastine. Uh, you give up the generic left-handed first baseman. He bats left, but he throws right. Uh, but the double play that he turned on Friday night yeah. was great. So you get the defensive plus by putting Vastine at first base. And on the flip side, if you pair somebody, and this was a really uh, thoughtful point and these guys are very smart, so it's not new for them, but it's a very thoughtful point from Coach Shoemaker and Brooks Webb and some of the guys as I was talking about it on Sunday. Um, the strength of Dom Keegan as a catcher is his veteran leadership, plus he's got the stronger arm. Jack Bolger is very cerebral. He understands pitching a lot, but his arm strength isn't as high. But... If you pair him with Carter Halton, a left-hander that holds the runner really well, you compensate a little bit for the lack of arm strength for Jack Bolger. That's not to say he can't throw That's runners out. That's a great out, point. But, yeah. Right? So very, they're, they're very intentional with all of this sort of stuff. So Bolger makes sense as a starting catcher when you're throwing a lefty like Carter Halton or somebody that's really good at holding the runners on. Um and then you can put Keegan back at first, and you still get the offensive punch of Keegan and Jack Bolger in the lineup. So 
it really does feel like a year in which, and we'll find out, I don't think they're going to turn the lineup over every single game, right? There's going to be some people that need to be in their spots on a consistent basis. But there's a lot of strengths to these guys. And you're choosing which strength you want to pair with other people's strengths. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that, yeah. that's that's where that's going to be really interesting throughout the course of the season. And I don't know that it's going to be, oh, we have to throw Gavin Cassis at first base. Or we need Jonathan Vastine at first base. Or Bulger behind the plate. Or Keegan behind the plate. Um, the skill set of everybody provides flexibility within lineups for Coach Corbin. Yeah, first base, I'm glad you mentioned Cassis. That's another one that I have forgotten to mention. Cassis is a kid they really like. I think is a big power-hitting guy for them potentially. He was hurt last year, and so that set him back going into the winter. I think that maybe he'd been healthy. I'd, I think you might have seen him starting out there. I mean, you certainly saw him in a big at bat where he had a sack fly that I think either got them within a run or tied the game on Sunday. And frankly, yeah, he thought it was it, a home run. He oh, look, you, you catch that another half inch up the barrel, then then that is a home run, right? I mean, it, it looked like it. it's a grand slam. They probably win the series. We're feeling differently. Um, I, I think he's an option. Vastine, to me, you mentioned that double play. Because I'm watching, and you, you see enough baseball that you have instincts. I wasn't even thinking about him turning two. Uh, but but he didn't hesitate. And I think Riley, whoever it was, I think it was Riley, got over to the bag and, and finished it off. But that's that's a place where you got a left side of the infield guy, second base guy potentially two, who I think he's got some arm talent that you don't usually see at first, and that probably made that possible. You mentioned Keegan having played there. I just think that they've got, you know, Bolger played there or Leneve, one of the two. I think it was Leneve in the fall, although I don't think that's in the plans. That's another place that I think I'm glad you dug down deeper because I don't think I exhausted all the possibilities there. And of course, Colwick started there a time or two also. This season of the Vandy Sports Podcast is made possible by my friend, Dr. Jody Jones, DDS. When it comes to general or cosmetic dentistry services, Jody is the best in Nashville. And just check out his client list. It testifies to that. He sees movie stars, music stars, athletes, coaches, you name it. Jody is the dentist of choice for stars in Nashville. But he sees regular folks like you and I as well. And what people like about the experience is the ambiance. Someone described it to me as a tooth spa. I went in and looked at it myself. That's exactly what it is. It is a relaxing, friendly environment. So whether your dental needs are general or cosmetic, go see Jody. Call him at 615-270-2322. His office is located at 55 Music Square East, not far from downtown Nashville, not far from the Vanderbilt campus. Jody is a former Vanderbilt football player, a huge booster of Commodore Athletics. His support as the title sponsor for Season 7 is the reason we are able to do this podcast. Go see Dr. Jody Jones today. Thank him for his support of the Vandy Sports Podcast and tell him you heard about it here. Yeah, Gavin Cassis is really interesting. Just watching him during training, and these these are my own two eyes. This isn't anybody else's eyes. I, I think he looks like a prospect with a high ceiling that needs to find comfort uh, and consistency within his game. I don't think he's the defensive player that a Jonathan Vastine is. And I don't know that he should be expected to be because Vastine's a middle infielder playing first, but, you know, point taken, right? And I think Gavin's probably young uh, when it comes to his offensive approach. Very skilled, high ceiling, uh, but he feels like someone to me that can be part of an offensive, an offensive lineup. Right? Yeah. Like if, if you're in a situation where you need extra pop in the bats uh, and for, for whatever reason you need Keegan behind home plates, and Bulger's still going to DH and you feel like you need some extra pop against whatever the matchup is, he feels like he can give you the offensive punch while not being a problem defensively, but he still feels like he needs consistency throughout the course of his game. If that makes any sense, but, but, but he's still really good. Like if he was playing first base today, great. He, He seems like a great player to me. Well, here's the thing. 
It seems like baseball players across the spectrum are getting hurt more than they've ever gotten hurt. I don't know all the variables. I would think that probably they're playing more ball, which puts more wear and tear on your body. You've got, oh man, I mean, the COVID thing, I think, in 2020 really affected a lot of conditioning and other things in 2021. I don't know if there's still a carryover to there, but like even before COVID hit, right, you go back to 2019, and this is before you were here, you had Pat DeMarco get hurt for a while. Um, They had another injury. I think it was Jason Gonzalez, Um, and and Gonzalez was hitting really well at the time, and both those guys got hurt. Um, I believe Vandy just needed oh, a spot. Well, even for me, yeah. right? Like I showed yeah. last year, and Carter Young's banged up. And yeah, Jake Colwick has an hammock entry. Now Davis look, gets hurt I, I the first game of the year, which was before you were here. But yeah, yeah point it. Point is, guys get hurt, right? Yeah, they, they they do. And what's interesting about baseball to me is it's just so different. And I don't have any statistics. And this would be a, a valid question for an athletic trainer if they feel like there's any sort of uh, trends within injuries in the game of baseball today? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, But baseball injuries are different. Um, They're of the smaller variety, but the movements in baseball are so minute that it becomes a problem. I mean, if you break your hamate bone as a hitter, that's an issue. And I think that's what Tay Kolick did, right? I think he broke his hamate bone. Yep. And then then he had another hand injury on top of that. Yeah, Yeah. right. that, that's as you swing, and that creates a huge issue for you as a hitter. Um, it's not an uncommon – in fact, it's a very common baseball injury. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I don't know if there's trends within injuries. It's just – in fact, I would take it probably to a different place than you, Chris. I, I, think, I think that's in part what makes this program great is the fact that it can sustain injuries because your depth is that much better, Right. Yeah, you know, Alabama football is great because their third string left tackle is eventually going to be an All-American. And that doesn't mean that, you know, right on down the line, everybody on this roster is an All-American and, and all of them need to get better from Davis Diaz to Matthew Polk to whatever. But if but if Matthew Polk goes to left field because Javi Baz rolls an ankle one day, I, I've watched Matthew Polk destroy a couple of pitches to the opposite field. Like... He's a pretty good player. So that's what makes this program great is the depth that allows it to withstand just the inevitable bumps throughout the course of a season. It's just going to happen. Yeah, and and you're naming some names I was going to get to next. I think Polk didn't play all weekend. You could see him um, going down the list here. You've got, you know, Leneve is not locked into a job, but I, th- I think he could hold one full time. Calvin Hewitt, maybe their fourth outfielder. You didn't see him all weekend. They think he's gotten better. Uh, Rob Gordon, we didn't see. I think he could play a little bit for them. Vaz, you know, if they get somebody hurt in the middle infield, have a rash of injuries, he can go to second. Uh, Davis Diaz, I'm, I'm shocked we didn't see more this weekend, but I understand it why. We mentioned Cassis. I just think that this well, is a I'll depth jump, is the hallmark of the weekend. That. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll jump in very quickly on that, and then we can probably exhaust other topics if you want, Chris. But I think back to last season with Tulane. Uh, Tulane had a player by the name of Chase Inglehart. He's their second baseman. He did not start opening day, and then in the second game he did start, and he hit a home run and became one of the more consistent players throughout the course of the season. If that doesn't feel like a Tim Corbin-esque playbook from Travis Jewett, I don't know what is, yeah. right? So because there's so much depth, one, it forces the talented guys down a spot. But two, obviously there's a desire to help these younger players get comfortable in these situations, especially when you open up against Oklahoma State. So Diaz not playing, I read that one more about uh, a young player uh, getting comfortable with this stage. That makes sense. Like I feel yeah, like what yeah. Travis did with Chase is about the same thing that Corbin did with Davis Diaz. Yeah. Let's switch back to pitching for just a minute, uh, and then we'll wrap up here in a couple minutes, maybe with a basketball thing or two. But did you get the sense? I guess Futrell, if he's starting today, would have started yesterday. I'm wondering what their pitching plan would have been had they gone through with the, a full two midweek games. I have no idea, uh, just to be blunt. Uh, 
I really don't. Um, I'm, I'm sitting here trying to think on, on exactly what they might have done, but I don't, I don't know necessarily, and I, I hesitate to venture a guess. Uh, yeah, th- this is, I'll give you some guesses in my mind. I think you would have seen Gage Bradley. I think you would have seen Bryce Cunningham. And again, you may see these guys today. I think Grayson Carter would have thrown a little bit. They might have gotten Jack Anderson out there a little bit because he just threw one inning this weekend. Um, maybe Ginther would have thrown. Um, Donia Evans, I don't know if I mentioned him. I, I think you would have seen a, a smorgasbord of options. But I, I think the big thing that will be interesting is when we see Fatrell today, how long does that go? Because, again, I think he's, in their mind, one of their, their chief arms among the freshman class. Well, if we're going to read through the tea leaves over the weekends, I think from Chris McElpain to Nick Maldonado to Carter Holton, they all went about four innings. They all went about 60 to 70 pitches. So that's probably a decent place to start. Anything else with baseball worth the mention? I leave for Hawaii in one week. That's definitely worth a mention. (laughs) (laughs) What's the what's the schedule no, for that look there. like with with leaving and and you know when when you're at the airport when you land all that 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 would be interesting to know. I have no idea at the moment. We leave Wednesday of next week, uh, so we play Tuesday, leave the next day, uh, play Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, and then return on Tuesday. So it's a I guess it's a full seven days from travel to travel. You're like me. You just don't ask questions and show up when you're told. When does the bus leave? <laughs> right. When, tell, tell me again I'll when I need leave. to be there. Great. Okay. I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm like that too. I, fortunately, I have a wife to don't handle these late. things. When does the bus leave? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm with yes. you on all of that. <laughs> uh, hoops for a minute. Nice win for Vandy over the weekend. Tough loss last night. Again, a, a shot to win in the final seconds, and, and or at least to tie it, doesn't go their way. Any, any overriding thoughts on the Hoops team? Well, the Texas a and win was a good one and a very necessary one. Uh, I think that's right there on the cut line for a first day buy at the SEC tournament. Uh, I think A&M falls to 11 at the moment, and Vanderbilt is 10. So you stay off of day one. So that was really good. Um, you know, outside of that... Uh, it was great to see Liam Robbins perform the way that he did yesterday. I think 16 points against Alabama. Uh, he felt like a factor. He stepped back. He knocked down a three. Uh, boy, you still wish Rodney Chapman was out there. Uh, yeah. That's just, that's kind of been life for the Hoops team. Uh, you've got a great player in Scotty Pippen. You've got good performers in Jordan Wright. And Melora Brown has been good throughout the course of the season, but... The team has always looked different when Rodney Chapman is on the floor. Uh, not saying they win that game with Rodney, but maybe. Um, so I guess that's kind of it for me. I, I don't have huge new innovative thoughts when it comes to the men's basketball team. Um, you just you just wish you had a few more pieces throughout the course of the season. Uh, you just wish you had more from Rodney. You wish you had more from Liam throughout the course of the season, and it just feels like the the direction of all of it would have been a little bit different. Having said that, they're still having a season that I think validates at least some level of growth. It would would be nice to see more of it, uh, and I'm sure Coach Stackhouse feels the same way, Uh, but they've they've certainly shown some growth, and, you know, let's see what they can do. They got Mississippi State next coming up on Saturday. That's down in Starkville. Uh, let's let's keep yourself off of day one at the SEC tournament down in Tampa, and, and let's see if you can't grab a game or two down there and just kind of let the chips fall where they're going to fall. They've started the batting practice music, haven't they? Uh, they sure have. It's warm-ups out in left field. Uh, the cage is waiting right behind home plate, so BP is on its way here in the next five to ten minutes. Yeah, I, I didn't know we'd have a soundtrack for this, but um, you know, you, you just never know what you're going to get on the show. So we can do this in the future. I can we, we I could, could. Up, you know, Spotify, whatever it happens to be, and just do a nice little you know background track for all of this. Am I allowed requests? As long as I'm uh, as long as I'm allowed veto power. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Well, it's uh, 
you know, it feels like baseball weather. I'm, I'm sitting here. It's 36 oh. degrees. It's damp, um, which means, you know, either we're rained out or, we're, or, or there's a baseball game today, right? Uh, it feels like college baseball weather to me. Yes, yes. Well, this is, you know, it, you get, get used to it because about maybe mid-April you'll start seeing something different. It's that, that magical ability of Mother Nature <laughs> – to just rain on everybody's parade right when this team's got a game. Uh, so you saw it last weekend. We'll you saw it in the midweek. Just get used to it because I'm telling you that is the way it is around here. That's I've lived it. Uh, it's never fun. I'm still waiting for the phone call one day that says we're playing a doubleheader starting at 10, uh, 10 a.m. So <laughs> right. I've been there and done that. Yeah. Well, you know, I had some of that yesterday. Mississippi State had an early game, I think, that started at 10 in the morning. I don't know if that was scheduled that way or – or what happened? I'm but, sure uh, it wasn't. Yeah, I'm I wouldn't. Sure I wouldn't think it would be. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it wasn't. But uh, <laughs> without looking it up, um, Andrew, tell folks about the the podcast. Anything else coming out of the school uh, that you guys would like to tell the audience about? Uh, I will start here. Uh, this is kind of just my own personal little venture that I've been uh, supported from the athletic department with. Uh, we're going to start featuring some up and coming artists. Uh, Nashville-based artist in our radio broadcast. It will be very, very small, like little snippets of their song coming back from break. Uh, but it's a little thing. I like the way it augments the sound of the broadcast, and I like the ability to spotlight some talented musicians here in town. Uh, so be on the listen for those. I, I find that just kind of, if nothing else, fun. <laughs> for, yeah. for lack of a better word, Chris, I just think it's fun. Uh, so we're going to do that. Um, uh, don't don't forget... Um, I'll, I'll pump this one too. Uh, I know they, they have just finished recording a Q and a between Candace and Billie Jean King. I believe that one is going to be available as kind of like, a uh, I don't know. It, 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 you can watch it, I guess, live March 1st. Uh, so that was all over social media there for a couple of days. Go back and, and check it out and find out how you can register to watch that. We actually, I, I got the, real honor, I guess, of, of hosting a Q&A with Billy Jean uh, last Thursday for some you know, people internally, like student athletes and whatever it happened to be. And it was, uh, that was really kind of very surreal when Billy Jean King knows your name and you get to kind of chat with her and ask her questions and all that kind of stuff. That was very cool. It was internal, but the, the external public one is coming up March 1st with Candace. Uh, and I certainly encourage people to uh, register for that. Yeah, that, that's probably not a podcast you thought you'd be doing, is it? Uh, no. Um, she was very nice. Yeah. Very nice. And fresh off fresh off flipping the coin at the Super Bowl. Yeah, uh, so that and, was, a, and a legend in her game. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah oh my, and the, the world and everything. So um, she was incredibly kind and gracious with her time. We went about 45 minutes, again, internally for staff members and for student-athletes. Um, and then she recorded something with Candace, which will be available publicly to watch on Tuesday, March 1st. So um, I would encourage anybody that hasn't seen it to go co-register for that and be on the lookout for some of the musicians that will feature in our radio broadcast this year. Vanable Baseball has never shied away from its tie to the music community. Um, you know, I... I have all I know is that I want to I, I just like it I, again I wish I had like a more innovative thoughtful thing like music is very much after sports in my blood um, and I just I I know there's a lot of really talented musicians in this town and um, if, if we can do a, a tiny little part to to shine the spotlight on good music and not just country music right like the first the first guy we're featuring starting tonight is is much more of like the singer songwriter I, I, I say Ben Rector because I know he's a Belmont guy uh, kind of that ilk um, if you are familiar with Ben Rector's music or not but uh, so it's not just you know generic country music it's it's going to be everything uh, to the best of my ability I just again I think it's fun I like the sound and um, if we can if we can do our tiny little part to to promote great music then awesome well, we did our own part today, whether it was intentional or not. So, in any case, yeah, this one is Jay Z, so I think Jay Z is fine without the promotion. Yeah, I don't and think Alicia he needs Keys. us. I think right. they're fine. Right? Yeah, I, just, I think Jay Z and Alicia Keys are fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they. I don't think they'll be skipping any meals. But uh, uh, no, that's good. Hey, uh, thanks for joining us, and we'll catch up with you again very soon. Sounds good, Chris. 
Thank you for listening to today's episode. We thank our presenting sponsor, Jody Jones DDS. We thank our other sponsors, Sutherland and Belk and MyPerfectFranchise.net. If you're interested in sponsoring this podcast, and that's how we make this work, please email me at chrislee70 at gmail.com. We also ask that you subscribe to our website, vandysports.com. That is $99 a year. You get things there that you don't get here. And of course, please rate, review, and subscribe where you see our podcast. That helps us get noticed. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at vandysports.com. Follow me at chrislee70. And finally, subscribe to our Vandy Sports YouTube channel as well. Thank you for listening to the Vandy Sports Podcast, which is part of the 440 Network. I'm your host, Chris Lee. We'll catch you with another episode coming very soon.